How's everybody doing today? Welcome to week 16. For one, can you believe we've been doing this for that long, dude? It's it's going pretty good. Um, life imitating movies. We're back kind of to our normal format where we're going to take a, interesting news stories from the week and pick movies that resemble those stories. Uh, first and foremost, how you doing this week, Mitch? Doing okay. Same old, same old. So starting to get into summertime, starting to get nicer out. So that's definitely something I'm looking forward to. Yeah, and a summer that we can actually maybe enjoy a little bit, not as much as, you know, two years ago, but more than last year, definitely. So uh, I guess let's launch right into it. The opening question, if you will, was just, you know, the last two weeks we talked about Oscars. So I just wanted to give a little wrap up after the actual broadcast of the Oscars because it was it was an interesting Oscars to say the least um I know you watched some of it I'm not sure did you see the whole show or or did you see like the highlights I did I I stayed up to watch the whole thing this year and Uh I say that because I'm old now and you know I was getting tired towards the end and I did manage to stay up for the entire thing because I have in years past tried to watch the whole thing and have either gotten too tired or fallen asleep. So I did stay up this year to watch the entire ceremony. That's good. Good, good, good. I mean, so as a whole, the, the ceremony for me, I, I enjoy the, you know, the intrigue I enjoy, especially when there were Oscar categories like best actress, which you didn't know who was going to win until it was announced. And, and that usually that's not the case this year. Obviously I went to Francis McDormand. I can't fault that even though I was rooting for Carrie Mulligan. Um, but how did you feel about when they announced Best Picture? I was like, I, I seriously was like, did I miss Best Actor and Best Actor? Like, what? why are they changing this up and everything? So did you have that, like, confusion as well? Yeah, I was pretty confused. I wasn't under the impression. I didn't think, like, a lot of people thought, like, did I miss something? Because I was sitting there watching it the entire time. I knew I didn't miss anything. But I thought, oh, wait isn't best picture usually the last one that they do of the night. So I'm with you where, yeah, that format was kind of a little odd. And also I'm with you a little bit where you kind of touched on it, where a lot of people who were expected to win the awards kind of won. I don't really think there were a lot of surprises this year. Not a lot of ones where it went to people who a maybe didn't deserve it or B some surprise winners, you know, people who were heavy favorites, but didn't win the award. I felt like, I was sitting there watching each winner being announced and they all went to the people who I thought they probably would. Okay. So with that said, well, with that said, would you say, because obviously they changed up the awards because they, it was, they believe Bozeman was going to take best actor and they thought they were going to end the show on this big emotional send off of Bozeman. And then Joaquin Phoenix, you know, he opens it up. He announces Anthony Hopkins. For my money, I have to say, I think I said in those in these episodes, Anthony Hopkins' performance is one of the best performances I have ever seen in my life. I wouldn't have been mad if Bozeman goes out as an Oscar winner because I loved Bozeman. I mean, last night, yesterday, I watched Draft Day again, and Bozeman's in it. Love, I love me some Bozeman. But Anthony Hopkins, for my money, won that Oscar, deservedly so. But it was just kind of funny the way it was open the envelope, Anthony Hopkins. Yeah, I I will say it was the show ended very suddenly because of that, because a Anthony Hopkins wasn't even there to accept it. And then B, because, again, they shuffled it around just because they thought Chadwick Boseman was going to win. And I'll be honest, I'm not really a huge fan of that move. It felt like they were maybe capitalizing on that a little bit, trying to write a narrative by shifting that to the end and expecting him to win so i think they should have just kept it as their original format save the best for last with the best picture winner at the very end because that's what it kind of builds to the whole night and look it wasn't guaranteed that bozeman was going to win sure a lot of people would have been happy to see that but it didn't mean that he was guaranteed because he had a great performance and yes unfortunately he passed on this past year way before his time but that doesn't guarantee someone will win the award it's certainly I, I i would be lying if i said it didn't have at least a little bit of an impact and affect people's votes a little bit because it does and and it should but again anthony hopkins you know probably deserved the award so i just think it was a bad move on their part to shuffle that around because that's what they thought would happen to 
try and create this artificial emotional moment. Yeah, uh, yeah, one hundred percent agree. Yeah, and and for Anthony Hopkins not to be there, which it it made it pretty funny in my book because when they when it became obvious what they were doing, I was I I, I said in my head I was just like it would be hilarious if you know somebody else wins and and it just like cuts and and that's pretty much exactly what happened and uh yeah it was interesting but so i mean there were the the the, the there wasn't any entertainment really in the show either they they didn't show movie clips for the nominees which is one of the parts i like when they announce the nominees they show the clips from the movies and whatever they didn't do that i didn't like that at all and then they had like that one game in the middle which was the guess the music game, which sucked until Glenn Close did her thing and completely saved it. Yeah, so overall, I would say this is probably one of the weakest shows I've seen in years past because obviously they didn't really have a host, which I didn't really like. I think it could work if they don't have a host, but I just don't think they did it right this year. But I think a host just kind of connects the whole thing and they have little opening monologues and jokes and little segments that they do like you know the selfies or something in between parts and nominees so I I didn't really like that they didn't have a host and again it's just I don't know why they showed clips for some categories but not for others and I don't I didn't like that either because I didn't really I feel it made you feel like you didn't really have any stake in the ones where they didn't show any clips because you if you hadn't heard of them you're thinking okay then what do I care who wins this I don't really know visually what any of these look like or would get me interested in watching them because I'm seeing part of it right now. So yeah, I didn't like that they didn't play any clips. And again, it's just the whole thing just felt kind of dry and, and just not as good as years past. Yeah. 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 I'll end on that. Yeah. You hit the nail on the head. The, the, this year's Oscar was, uh, you need a host. It was proof positive. It needs a host. I, the Regina King opening, it wasn't funny. It wasn't, it was okay. I mean, I like Regina King. I thought, you know, if she was nominated for one night in Miami. I would have been happy with that because I thought she did a great job, but it just was not good. Her opening wasn't good. It wasn't a great way to open the show. You need a comedian to step out there, make jokes, bust balls, and like bring it home, have that connective tissue throughout the show that this, this one sorely lacks. So I, I hope next year, maybe they get somebody like a Ricky Gervais to bring it out and do like what he did for the Golden Globes. So first story out of the gate is there was a pretty big story this week about a uh, a missing submarine that um, was unfortunately found apparently broken in three separate parts on the bottom of the ocean. Um, it, was a, it's a, it was an interesting story. You know, you don't, you don't hear too much about that type of stuff in today's world. And it, it, to me, it felt like a very cinematic story you know, a submarine gone missing and then found broken in part and everything. And all the crew members obviously, unfortunately passed away. So how would you think about that story and all that? Yeah, it just, you never really hear these days about somehow an entire vessel go missing, whether it's a submarine or an airplane, because we have all this technology and tracking and GPS. And it just, you, you would think that it's really hard for something like that to happen for a vessel to just be lost and then eventually found in this case, but for something like that to happen in the first place. So very unfortunate. I was kind of reading stories and updates during the week before they found it about how it was missing and that air supply was going to run out after a certain amount of time. So I can't even imagine what the crew must have gone through for that. Well, there was a story I read after it. Um, I didn't flag it. It wasn't in this story, but apparently there was a transmission of all the crew members together singing a song as if they knew they were going to, this was the end for them. And they were all got together and sang together, which reminded me of like Titanic where like the band played on as the ship went down and stuff. So it is definitely a tragic story. Um, One that, you know, we don't usually touch on those tragic stories on this. We try and keep it lighthearted, but you know, but I guess that'll lead in, you know, my movie, I, I did pick a movie that was a little bit more lighthearted to, to juxtapose, if to use a film term. But I went with Yellow Submarine, you know, the Beatles, Yellow Submarine, because, you know, it's a submarine movie. Great music. I'm a, I'm a, I love the Beatles. First, my brother introduced me to the Beatles and, and I've loved them ever since. And, you know, I don't have you ever seen it? It's an animated movie. It's a, it's a, it's a trippy movie. 
I've seen bits and pieces, clips, but I've never really seen the full movie. But of course, as with everybody else on planet Earth, I'm familiar with the Beatles music, of course. I, I, I don't know a single person out there who actively dislikes their music. And if there is that person, then I wouldn't be able to trust them. Because who doesn't yeah. like the Beatles music, if, if not even they're impartial to it? So I'm sure it's certainly an interesting movie, but... It's not really something that I would put at the top of my watch list, but probably very interesting watch. Yeah, I mean, it, it's basically if you like the Beatles music, you're going to mm. probably enjoy the movie. I mean, it's 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 one of those movies. I believe people always say you got to watch it high. I don't get high. I'm not a smoker or anything. I don't do that stuff. But it's like I can understand that because the visuals and the Beatles and in, in of itself and everything and Yellow Submarine, man. Is, is a great song man and and i think octopus's garden is in it and i love octopus's garden yeah as soon as you said the words the yellow submarine of course that song popped in my head and now it's stuck there so you know the beatles are just one of these all-time iconic bands that everyone knows their music in some way shape or form so i'm sure it's an enjoyable movie oh yeah so with that how did you go with this did you go lighthearted? did you go yeah, there's when I was researching this, obviously, there's a lot more submarine movies out there than I thought there was. And a lot of them were kind of made in years past. And a lot of them were obviously about World War Two or different wars. And there weren't really a ton of modern kind of submarine based movies. So I actually picked a, a repeat movie that we've talked about on the podcast here before. But a submarine is kind of integral to the plot of the movie Aquaman from 2018. And if you remember the movie, it's because a submarine is kind of hijacked at the beginning, and that's kind of the opening action set piece. And then it's used as a catalyst to try to start a war between the Atlanteans and the surface world. So that's where I kind of tied it, tied it back to, into the story. So we've already covered here on the podcast a little bit, but Anything else you want to add about Aquaman? Because I really like it. I think it's action-packed, well-shot, well-directed, very colorful. Uh, I liked how they did the underwater effects and all that that kind of went with it. James Wan involved with with this one, great filmmaker. So anything else you wanted to kind of add about Aquaman here? No, nah, I'd say of the DC movies, that is my favorite one. I would say Aquaman is my favorite of the DC. I like the character. The visual effects in it were excellent. Um, yeah, nothing really more to add that we haven't already said. Just I'm looking forward to the sequel. Absolutely. Same here. So the next story from the past week, we're dealing with this child prodigy who graduated high school and college in the same week. He used his time during the pandemic to take tons of extra classes and was able to graduate both within the same week. So it's one of these things you kind of read and you think, what are you doing with your life? You know, it's just reading about this really impressive kid. So this was just a fun kind of story that we could use some interesting, lighthearted things like this to read about. So what did you kind of think reading this story? Well, I was pretty dumb in that. I didn't, I, I guess I knew you could get above a 4.0, but how do you, how do you get a 5.45 GPA? I never, I guess I never, I thought 4.0 was straight A's. So how do you get above all A's? I, A pluses? I, I never, I, I don't, that's how dumb I am. I would think extra credits, um, extra work, uh, things where maybe something is graded on a curve, where if he was at the top of it and performed exceptionally well, it just, there's all these different factors that probably go into it. And I've never even come close to a 4.0 GPA, let alone a 5 GPA. So really good for this young man, and the future is certainly very bright for him. That's, a, that's another – I mean, I graduated high school with like a 1.6, but I graduated along with everybody else, all right? I graduated above my friend, you know, because my last name begins with H, and his name begins with P. So, you know, I graduated before all my friends, but and they all had like – you know, they were all honor roll. But for college, you know, I graduated college with perfect attendance and a 3.8. So, you know, I'm happy with that. I'll, I'll yeah, a little, little humble brag there. So yeah, yeah. In, in terms of movies relating to this, I kind of went the child prodigy route. So the movie I selected for this was a little animated movie called Big Hero 6 with obviously I knew, a... I knew you were going to pick that. 
a, a young child genius kind of at the center who deals with his the loss of his brother and his robot Baymax that we all know and love and his microbots that he creates. So Big Hero 6, I think, I don't think anyone anyone really looks down on this movie, but I still think it's it's a little underrated. You know, it's a very fun, original kind of animated movie by Disney Pixar. And I'm surprised they haven't done more to make sequels or spinoffs or just basically do what they usually do with a popular movie that they have and run it into the ground with other properties. I, when looking at, I, I, I did type in, you know, movies with, with intelligent kids and Big Hero 6 popped up and I was like, in my head, I was like, that's the movie Mitch is going to pick. I, I know it. And you did. And I didn't pick it as well because I hadn't seen it in so long. I couldn't really talk intelligently about it. So I didn't pick it. But I think they did do a, an animated show on Disney, didn't they? I think Betamax or something. They did. They did some kind of animated series. And I, I just, I'm just i just surprised because usually it, when studios want to make the most money off of a film that did well and kind of extend the, the timeline for it, they would make a, a sequel. They would make an animated movie sequel to this because movies are where the most money is made. Although I'm sure I can't really speak for toy sale numbers, which I'm sure were pretty good for this as well, along with all the other Disney movies. But that's where the money is. If a studio really wanted to make the most money, they would have made a direct sequel to this as soon as possible. So we still might see one someday. It's not completely off the table. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if we see it, because it is a Marvel property too, I think. I think it was based off of Marvel and stuff. So my pick was a movie from the 80s, John Hughes, Weird Science. <laughs> Two genius kids create a woman on the internet. I mean, it's it's a great movie. Yeah, I, I'm familiar with Weird Science, but I haven't seen it. So I, I know of it. I, I've seen bits and pieces, but haven't really seen the whole thing. So my first question, kind of dealing with this movie, talking about in 2021, do you think this movie gets made today if someone came to the table with the same concept and same th if this movie had never been made in the 80s? Do you think it would have been able to be made today with its its plot? I think, yeah, I, I would say they could make it today, but it would be more, uh, you know, the because honestly, the model in it, I think it was Kelly LeBrock, I believe, but I believe she was she was pretty a strong woman character. She was like she wasn't just there as eye candy. She was pretty. She was a strong female character. Obviously, John Hughes movies have come under fire in recent times due to you know you look through the goggles of now and criticize the movies of the past but um so there would be some changes obviously but it's hard to you can't change perfection man john hughes movies were pretty well perfection yeah and i think this isn't really the john hughes movie that everybody talks about when they talk john hughes but it's certainly you know people look back on the movies that he's made with reverence and they really like his his work so i think this isn't really the top of the list if somebody's doing a john hughes marathon but Obviously, a filmmaker that is loved by a lot of people that people are very nostalgic for when they think about the 80s and his movies. So certainly something to put on your John Hughes watch list if you wanted to just run through all of his movies. All right. So another story that came out pretty much the day after the Oscars was uh, the Oscar winner this year for Best International Film, Another Round is uh was bought for remake rights by leonardo dicaprio's company with a potential starring role for leonardo dicaprio in it and and the reason i picked it, even though we'd already talked about the oscars in another round a little bit was this for me is one of those movies where i mean you, you always hear the internet get a fervor or whatever about like how dare they remake the perfection i'm sorry you always hear the internet talk about how they get in fervor about you know how dare they remake perfection and um and and for me, this is a movie where I kind of agree, because when I saw another round, I thought that was a damn near perfect movie. And even though Leonardo DiCaprio is one of my favorite actors, I just don't see how they improve on the original. Yeah, I'm willing to give it the benefit of the doubt, because we've had kind of almost shot for shot remakes made of either foreign films or one film to another. To give an example for that. There was a Swedish movie, excuse me, called Let the Right One In. And then it was remade a few years later in America, and it was shortened to Let Me In. And 
a lot of people said because the original was good why why do we need to remake it why do we need to put our own spin on it when the original is already very good and let me in i think that one i can't remember what kind of reviews it got at the time but it turned out well and another example again in the horror genre because maybe this is a trend in that genre but another example is the japanese movie ring you which was then later remade into the ring so i'm willing to give this one the benefit of the doubt sometimes even if you're making a shot for shot remake, it could still add something or even just seeing different performers or a different way that it's shot, even if, if it's the same plot and the same setting. I think it still could bring something to the table. So I'm willing to wait and see on this one. Yeah, I, I give you, I will see it. Yeah. And I mean, it, it is director based. Like you said, Let Me In, I believe, is directed by Matt Reeves, who is obviously a great filmmaker, did Planet of Apes, he's doing the next Batman movie. Uh, Ring the Ring was a Gore Verbinski movie who did the Pirates movie, so it really does rely on who they bring in to direct and 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 what type of director they are, I guess, for lack of a better term. And and um, yeah, I mean, for, in the sake of brevity, my movie pick was another round. We've already discussed it. So, what you did you how'd you go with this one? So I will say I think we've talked about this movie on the podcast before, but if not, everyone knows it, and we'll just kind of touch on it briefly. When I think Leonardo DiCaprio in this movie, he's going to be drinking to excess. I think, all right, what's a movie that he's been doing things to excess in with substances? The Wolf of Wall Street. So, again, I can't quite remember if we've covered this movie before, but obviously everyone knows that this did very well at the box office when it came out. It's nearly a three-hour movie, but I remember when this came out, I actually saw it twice because it came out in December and I was kind of on break from college. I went to see it with a couple different kind of friend groups when it came out. I really liked it. Probably the last movie that I would want to watch with my parents or grandparents, but still a very good movie. Martin Scorsese, one of my favorite working directors today. Oh, yeah. And I think Wolf of Wall Street has one of the records for like the number of F words in it, which I will get to later with another movie we discuss. Um, and yeah, it's a, for it, that to me is a damn near perfect movie, even though it's not my favorite Scorsese movie because, you know, you have Goodfellas obviously is up there and departed, but it's such a great movie. And DiCaprio, I mean, that's one of those solidifying movies where I was just like, yeah, DiCaprio can do everything. Yeah. Unfortunately, one of these times where Scorsese and DiCaprio teamed up where again, Leo didn't win the Oscar. So probably should have this year. That's up for debate. He lost it this year when Wolf of Wall Street came out in 2014 to Matthew McConaughey for his performance in Dallas Buyers Club. So up for debate about whether Leo should have won the Oscars. He certainly gave a amazing performance in this movie. So what else can you say about it? So our next story here was something I found really kind of funny and interesting during the week where I saw stories come out about this, where there was this massive kind of fake fight between all these people named Josh for the rights to the name in this random open field in Nebraska. Just this fun, everyone had pool noodles and were just kind of fighting each other and just kind of whacking away. And it just looked like a really fun get together, a bunch of people who dressed up and just had a, a bunch of fun kind of dueling each other and just... It just looked like a fun time and, you know, even more so because the winner was this four-year-old named Josh who they gave it to, you know, what have you. But it seemed like a really just fun, wholesome event that people took part in. Yeah. So, like, one of my closest friends is named Josh. Uh, I've known him for th over 30 years and everything. And when I was reading this story, you know, we sent, I sent him the link and everything. And I just was thinking, like, you know, the four-year-old won at the end. But knowing my Josh, my friend Josh... Uh, he would have never let the four-year-old win. He would have come in at the end and hit the kid with the full noodle just so he could win. That, that's, that's not my friend Josh. And I, I, I think that's pretty funny. Um, I, I, I like that they let the four-year-old win, though. So we might have the same movie on this one because when I was reading this story, I thought immediately of this scene in this one movie where they did something similar with a group of people getting together and dressing up and kind of, you know, dueling with foam weapons and such. And that's the movie Role Models. So did we have the same movie on this or no? That's unfortunate. But anyway, Role Models, there's uh, a scene where the kid in the movie played by Christopher Mintz Plass is part of a LARPing community. And for those who don't know what that means, it's live action role playing where people dress up in costumes and kind of 
fight with foam or plastic weapons and just kind of have these battles or little get togethers or duels. So this clearly made me think of that movie and that scene. Role Models, I think is an okay comedy. I wasn't as enamored with this movie when it came out and everyone else was seeing it and said, this was hilarious. You got to see it. And I did. And I thought it was just okay. So I'm kind of in the minority, I guess, on that one, because it seemed like, again, a lot of people when the movie came out really loved it. And I just thought it was an okay comedy. Yeah, you are in the minority on that one. That to me is uh, one of the best comedies I think ever, dude. It's, 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 it's not even it's the script is hilarious and the 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 the, the improvs in the movie are hilarious and then yeah no i love role models very much and i can see how you came to that movie that one didn't even cross my head in all honesty um i i guess i'll i'll launch into mine because mine is a movie that you may not have heard of but when i heard this story it was the only movie i thought of and it's a movie that came out a few years ago called joshy you heard of joshy Okay, now, so Joshy, you remember a few years ago, there was this trend of this mumblecore trend, which essentially was these low budget indie movies that were, they would give an outline of what the story was, but it was all improv. So all the dialogue was improvised. And so this movie has Thomas Middleditch, Adam Pally, Nick Kroll, Jenny Slate, you know, a lot of big, big time improvisers and stuff. And it's just about Joshy as a guy who's going to get married, his wife kills herself. So then him and his friends go on the the um, the bachelor party they were going to go on anyway to this house in the, in the in the woods or whatever in the mountains to kind of like cheer them up from it and everything. And it's it's a funny movie, but it's also got like that, you know, kind of dramedy type part of it. And I watched it again the other day because I hadn't seen it since it came out. And it, it's it's pretty good, man. I mean. Do you know who those people are, Thomas Middleditch and all of them? I knew a couple of those names, but I can't say I knew all of them. Right on. Well, I mean, Thomas Middleditch and Adam Pally are people who, when I did improv in L.A., they were people I saw doing improv. And, like, so I became massive fans of them because they were, like, two of the funniest people who I saw doing improv. So, like, when Thomas Middleditch, you know, got pretty big with Silicon Valley and all that, I was like, right on, because he was one of my favorite improvisers and and, and this this mumblecore genre they have some good movies man there's one one of my favorites is called drinking buddies with anna kendrick or whatever just an improv movie it's phenomenal so you learn something new every day that's certainly one of those more out there recommendations these kind of movies where we've talked about on the show where people may not have ever heard of them that you know maybe some people might check out based on our recommendations so you know this is just part of the show where we talk about popular movies we talk about not so popular ones so i like to think that we have a pretty wide array of movies that we are able to discuss and kind of talk about that maybe people haven't heard of before yeah and i think you are kind of familiar with mumblecore because you've talked about those vhs movies and those would fall into the mumblecore genre, although they may be a little bit more scripted. But those directors, Joe Swanberg, um, the guy who just did um, Monsters, um, Godzilla vs. Kong, Adam Wingard, he started as like a mumblecore type director and stuff. So, uh, you know, it may be a genre that you didn't hear of, but you've actually seen them. All right, so the next story was just a, a story about a guy who picked up a 7-10 split in professional bowling. Apparently... It hadn't happened since 1991. I was under the impression that professional bowlers were just like able to get 7-10 splits like like they were nothing, but apparently not. But I brought this movie to the table because I wanted to ask. We both met in sports-related things. We both enjoy sports. To you, is bowling a sport? Yes. I mean, it involves physical exertion and skill, which is what I determine as the core values for a sport. And look, esports and NASCAR and these other kind of ones that people debate about whether or not they're sports, that's up for debate. That's a separate topic that, you know, we can cover offline or on a different type of show. But yeah, I think bowling does count as a sport. And I thought I found this this headline shocking too, where I can't believe I, I don't know what context they kind of mean in professional bowling in around thirty years that no one was able to nail a seven ten split because again, I think they I thought they were just trained how to do that, but 
I feel like there's one of two different movies that you can pick relating to this story, bowling movies to kind of relate to this. So I'm interested to hear what your pick is. All right. Well, first off, for my money, bowling is a game, not a sport, much like pool. Pool is a game, not a sport. So as you said, there are two movies that we could go with. We'll see if we pick the same one. If not, there the one I went with was Kingpin. Okay. I, I picked the same movie. I picked Kingpin. The other one I was kind of talking about as a bowling movie when I was doing research related to this story was The Big Lebowski, which technically a bowling movie. You could count it as that. But again, the true candidate in my eyes for a movie relating to the story, a bowling movie, was the movie Kingpin, perhaps an unknown comedy from the 90s that that not that many people may know about. I don't know if I'd go. I, I I'd say it was a pretty popular comedy. I thought maybe, maybe, maybe. I mean, we are what we're eight years apart. Maybe it's a generational thing because I remember seeing that in theaters with my grandma, and she cracked up. She loved it, man. And it's it's a hilarious movie from the Farrelly brothers. Obviously, Dumb and Dumber. There's something about Mary, and then Peter Farrelly went on to direct, you know, Green Book and won the Oscar for it, which I love. Just growing up on his comedy movies and seeing him take all these Oscars was was gnarly. But for my money, man, Kingpin is hilarious, man. It is, it is, it is a downright hilarious movie. Yeah, I think that's something it has going for it, where it's a comedy with a different type of premise, and it has different types of antics and characters to it. So it's got a solid cast. But I say maybe it wasn't known by mainstream audiences or listeners because, again, I wasn't really kind of fully mature when it came out in the '90s. I was still a little kid. And the way I saw it was because my dad had it on VHS and I just kind of watched it one day with him. But, you know, so that's why I say maybe this wasn't super well known at the time, because, again, if you mention the movie to somebody now in 2021, would they know the movie Kingpin? Yeah, I guess that's fair. Yeah. A lot of these good movies are falling by the wayside, stupid millennials. Yeah, so what do you have to say about Kingpin to kind of get people to see it? What kind of made you like the movie, or what do you think it has going for it that's different than other comedies out there? Well, for one, it's got Bill Murray. And I think anybody who likes any, if you like comedy at all, you must see every Bill Murray movie ever made. Because Bill Murray is a master of comedy, and it is phenomenal. And I, the Fairley Brothers... Those early Fairly Brothers movies, like I mentioned, there's something about Mary, Dumb and Dumber, Kingpin. Some of the later ones, not as good. But those early ones, man, are – they're a different breed of comedy. They're gut-level laughter comedy for me. Yeah, so I would certainly recommend Kingpin to anyone who wanted to check it out. Certainly a quirky, kind of different comedy that's based in bowling. So I think it's definitely worth a watch if people maybe haven't heard it or haven't seen it before. So for our last story of the week to kind of wrap up here, we're talking about the news of the movie Captain America 4 kind of being announced, but not really in a big way this past week. But Anthony Mackie is obviously going to be starring as the new kind of Captain America in this movie, and we don't really know too much about it yet. And we're not going to dive really into spoilers of the TV show, The Falcon and the Winter Soldier, but if you didn't know that Sam Wilson was going to become Captain America by the end of it. Sorry, but spoilers these days, they're almost non-existent. People don't really... Obviously, this was a big story that came out during the week. And yes, the, the title is sort of a spoiler about the end result of the show a little bit. But these are the times that we live in. So I, for one, am looking forward to this. I think it's going to be a breath of fresh air for the mantle of Captain America and Anthony Mackie certainly deserves this role, and I'm excited to see where they go with this. Yeah, it's, I wrote that as yeah. It's it's the the article in of itself is a spoiler for the show for the series. Um, as far as the movies go, yeah. Anytime a new Marvel movie gets announced, I look forward to it. I've enjoyed all the Marvel movies for the most part. Um, Anthony Mackie, I've loved since I first saw him in Hurt Locker. So more Anthony Mackie is a is always is always a welcome thing and it'll be interesting to see how they go with it what they do with it um you know it'll be i don't follow comics i think that's been pretty well established i i think the steve 
or what's his name? Sam, the Sam character, the Falcon character, I guess, in the comics became the Captain America. But I don't know anything about that storyline at all or anything. So it'll be all new to me. Right. So we'll see if they copy any storylines from that or where they kind of go with it. But I think it's a great idea and I think it's going to be interesting. Hopefully they do something a little bit different with it. So moving on, you know, I didn't really pick a Marvel movie related to this one because we've talked almost about all the the big Marvel movies. And Falcon is certainly a character that has been in the bigger ones, hasn't really gotten his own. But I picked a different kind of approach for this story with a movie related to it where I kind of took a role that Anthony Mackie had where he was jacked up like a superhero. And that's the movie Pain and Gain from your favorite director, Michael Bay. A few years back, he made this movie starring Anthony Mackie and Mark Wahlberg and Dwayne Johnson, The Rock. So what what do you think about this movie? Because it's it's certainly interesting and it's a little discombobulated, but it's definitely an entertaining watch. Oh, I love Pain Again. Hey, you're not lying. I mean, you say it in jest. I love Michael Bay. What can I say? Hey, hey, hey. Um, but Pain Again was interesting, yeah, because if you ever actually read the true story, and I, 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 a lot of people hated it in the movie, but like where Michael Bay will like just stop in the middle of the movie and just put, remember, this is a true story after something insane just happened in the movie. And you read the actual story of it. It is one of the most badass, insane like stories, criminal stories you've ever read or seen in your life. And, 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 and the movie did stay pretty true, I believe to what actually happened, which is why that movie is so insane. Yeah. That's why maybe it kind of, it starts off as a comedy and maybe a little bit of a heist movie, but then it just kind of takes a turn part way through and just turns into a different kind of genre of movie. So it certainly kind of has its funny moments and it's certainly entertaining. So I can't take that away from Michael Bay, even though I'm not as big of a fan of his as you are. But where did you kind of go with this? Did you land on a Marvel movie or like me, did you kind of pick an Anthony Mackie role to focus on? No, I thought this was one of those where I thought we'd definitely have the same movie because I just went with the first appearance of Sam, which was Captain America Winter Soldier. Because, you know, when it first came out, you know, I, I like the idea that Sam, the character, was just a dude. He wasn't a super soldier. He wasn't, you know, he didn't, he wasn't involved in a gamma ray experiment that made him her. He was just a dude who, like, came on as Captain America's, you know, buddy. He was his sidekick and everything. And Falcon, he had these wings and everything. So I kind of like the ascension of that character where he starts as the sidekick and now he is he is Captain America. Yeah, it's a great kind of storyline and character arc to kind of follow along with through all these different movies. But uh, Captain America and the Winter Soldier, this is basically how the Russo brothers got the job of directing the bigger movies down the line because... Captain America and the Winter Soldier is a fantastic movie. It's probably, if you twist in my arm, probably my favorite Marvel movie to date. And that's including the Avengers ones, the big ones, because I think this was the most well-made movie out of all of them. It did different things. It had great character moments, fantastic action, and a really intriguing plot. So I think those are some things that maybe have been not as good at as the Captain America Winter Soldier movie with the later ones where they were maybe still good in all those different areas, but maybe lacking a little bit, not quite as good, not as much of a different kind of well put together movie that the Russo brothers directed and came onto the scene with in the MCU with this one. Yeah, I think Winter Soldier was kind of the first, because yeah, you know, Iron Man, all those felt a little self-contained almost, even though they were part of the bigger thing. But I think Winter Soldier was the first one that kind of set the, I don't know the word, the mood or the tone for the movie, the the Marvel Cinematic Universe through Endgame. Who knows how it's going to look from there? I think Black Black Widow might have the same kind of feeling to it. But and, and it was interesting when I believe Winter Soldier was first announced because Joe and Anthony Russo were mainly known as uh, sitcom directors. They came from Community, that show Community. And so if you go back and read the internet, the internet from back when they were announced, you know, everybody was like, how oh, are they going to have comedy people come on to do these big movies? And they went on to be like, you know, the best possible directors for the, the, the series of movies. 
Absolutely. And look, like all the other Marvel movies, it still does have some humor in it. But I think that's part of the reason why I like this one so much more is because they didn't overload it with jokes or undermine a key scene with a joke or undermine a character's loss of a loved one with a joke or something getting destroyed and undermine it with a joke. That's something that I fairly often criticize about the Marvel movies these days is just they need to dial back the jokes. And that's never really a sentence that you would expect someone to say. But that's why I really love this movie is because it wasn't overtly dark and heavy and dramatic, but there were still mature elements to it and a mature storyline. And they, again, they still included some humor in it, of course, but it was just so well made and so adult like that. It wasn't just like holding your hand through it and wasn't kind of talking down to you. It was a very smart action movie. Yeah, I agree. Let's move on. So wrapping up this week's episode, we're talking about another new release movie. And we haven't really had quite that many. But again, a big movie that everyone's been talking about from the past week that we'll see if it gets made into a sequel. But that's the movie... So Mortal Kombat 2021, um, this was an interesting one to say the least because a lot of people were fans of the 90s ones when they came out and then a lot of people were looking forward to a reboot of this franchise because they think there's a lot of material there and it could be done a lot better than the 90s movies did it. So I want to get your impressions first because I'm getting the sense that you possibly liked it a little bit more than me. So what did you think of Mortal Kombat 2021? So when we first started this podcast, I said that one of my things was I didn't want to trash movies, but like the internet trashes movies because it just seems so easy and everything. Unfortunately, yeah, I, I hated this movie. I, uh, I did not like this movie at all, man. I was, I love the 95 one. I was really looking forward to this one. The trailers for this one were really good and i was like damn that looks like it's going to be a r-rated badass mortal Kombat." and man it just missed the mark so massively for me dude i even watched it twice because i was like all right i watched it the first time i was disappointed maybe the second time i'll see a little bit better no it, it still was just a massive disappointment for me and I, I have i have points i'll make on the on that specific points but let's hear your opinion first sure so i will say before we kind of dive too deep into this that we're not going into spoilers obviously this movie just came out not, not everyone has seen it yet maybe they see all these discussions and they want to check it out for themselves so we're not going to dive into spoilers just talking about what we liked or didn't like about the movie what we think worked or didn't work I'm surprised because I thought we may have had the same reaction to this movie that we had with Godzilla vs. Kong when we covered it a few weeks ago, where you were more of a fan of it and I wasn't quite as enthusiastic. So I'm surprised that you didn't really like it that much. And I guess maybe I didn't quite not like it as much as you. I think it got some things right, but overall, if we're going by the system these days that you see on streaming platforms or Google reviews or such, where it's either a thumbs up or a thumbs down, I would probably give this one a thumbs down. It's just, and it's a shame because I've said before on the show, I want every movie to be good. I don't really like trashing movies or saying that it's bad or watching bad movies. I just want movies to be good. I want every movie to be a great watch for the directors and the studios to get them right. I, I don't want to live in a world where we have bad movies, but unfortunately, Sometimes you have disappointments, and this was certainly one for me where I thought they had a lot to work with. They had some good talent, both in, fr in front of the camera and behind it, and a studio willing to back it with some decent amount of money for a budget. And it just, I don't know, the whole thing to me felt like, it felt like a student film. The effects qu weren't quite that great. The acting was okay. The writing was okay. It, it wasn't the worst movie I've ever seen, but... I think it was a disappointment when I was expecting what I was expecting. And also just in terms of, is it just a good movie period? I can't really say yes on that either. I mean, there's a lot to unpack with this movie and, and none of my points delve into spoiler territory, but I, there are things I 
hated about this movie. The first 10 minutes of this movie were so good. That first 10 minute stretch of this movie had me going, this movie's going to be gnarly, dude. This movie's going to be great. And then it just felt like they handed the movie over to a different writer and a different director to finish it, uh, to finish him. Um, <laughs> but like, you know, it just seemed like it just those 10 first 10 minutes were just like, yes, this is how you start a movie. It's going to be a serious, violent, gnarly movie. And the rest, the script, the jokes in it were just not funny. They were trying way too hard to be funny. I hated the jokes. Maybe two of them got like a huh, out of me. Um, even, all right, so for me, you know me. I enjoy a good curse word. And this is what I was talking about earlier with Wolf of Wall Street. Wolf of Wall Street has the F word thrown throughout the movie. But it's done so great. The script is so great that the F words flow through the movie. This movie... The F words in this movie just seemed like they were just thrown in like, oh, let's be edgy. Let's make an R rated movie where the F bomb is just thrown in. And for me, for me to say that is like that, that means something because I enjoy a good curse word. And it just was so horribly written. I thought that it was just like, God, it just took me out every time you heard the F word. It's like, what? That, there's no point for that there. Yeah, I'd agree with you on that a little bit where, again, it kind of goes back to what I said, where it almost kind of felt like a student film where they were trying to really drive home the cursing. And again, the effects were kind of not great, but they were functional. It just, the whole thing just felt kind of, it didn't really feel like a major studio movie. And this isn't really spoiler territory, but I think the way it was advertised versus what we got was kind of uh, a misdirection as well, where again, we're not going to go into spoilers, but you see the trailer for this movie, you see the posters for this movie, and you think the whole Scorpion Sub-Zero kind of connection and uh, argument and brawl between them is a, a big part of the movie. And it's there, but I feel like this was a, a misdirection in marketing where they kind of put that at the forefront, but that's not really the central kind of thing in the movie we explore. So, which is a shame because I think that would have been better subject material than we got but i just i don't like when studios do that when they misadvertise a movie when they falsely kind of picture what it's going to be about or what they lead people to think it will be about or they get the the tone wrong with their trailers or the posters and then people end up not liking it because they shot themselves in the foot with how they advertise the movie yeah exactly and that feeds into my huge, huge problem number two, Mortal Kombat is what? It's a tournament. There is no tournament in this movie. The movie has no tournament. And I can't stand when movies do that thing where they make an entire movie almost as a commercial for the potential sequel. And that's all this movie is, is a commercial for a potential sequel. And, and they do that, and they, like you said, they shoot themselves in the foot because people are going to not like the original because they didn't get what they were promised and they're not going to show up for the sequel that maybe delivers on the promise or whatever. It's like, just give me one self-contained movie that is gnarly. And for Mortal Kombat to not have a tournament in it at all was just like, that's not Mortal Kombat. I 100% agree because I really hate that's another thing that studios do these days where they make a movie just to make another movie that they don't really focus on the first one and make it a good standalone movie that they just cram it full of bait to come see the sequel, come pay to see the sequel because we kind of swindled you with this one. I don't like when studios do that these days where they make a, an entire movie just to get people to come out to see the sequel where the first one is a half baked terribly written bad acted just all these different things where they try and just swindle people to get them to keep coming back for more money in the future so i will say look i i'm still kind of looking forward to the sequel to this because again that's not really a spoiler excuse me saying that there's no tournament in this movie because that's almost kind of saving people some disappointment because i was very disappointed i kept kind of checking the runtime as I was watching this, and we're getting closer and closer to the end. And I thought, okay, when are they going to get to the tournament part of this? Because that's the central part of the conflict in the franchise where you adapt this. You need to have that that in there. And they just didn't include it. And it's just, 
So that's not really a spoiler. It's almost kind of saving people some disappointment where if they know not to expect that, maybe they might like it a little bit more. Maybe if they go in without that expectation of the actual Mortal Kombat tournament being in there, they might like it a little bit more. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, it's maybe, maybe possible. It's just man, it's Mortal Kombat is a tournament, and there's no tournament. And then, yeah, it's like you said, the casting for me, I, it felt off. I, I, I it, it did feel you. A student film is kind of a perfect analogy for it because the casting felt like it just felt off, man. It just felt off, and not to disparage any of the actors because I've seen them all in other great stuff, like the guy who plays Shang Tsung. He's phenomenal in The Dark Knight. He is such a great actor. I just didn't really like him in this movie, man. He just, I didn't, maybe comparing him to the guy from the 95 version, who I thought was phenomenal, maybe that comparison lessened his performance in my book. But yeah, dude, it was. I would almost say it's less the casting than it is the dialogue for me. I just don't think it was written that well. I think if they, if this cast was given good material to work with, good writing, that this cast could have pulled off a good movie. It could be, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I will give you that because there, there are plenty of examples of great actors with horrible scripts that just, you know, you know, De Niro couldn't couldn't pull off a, a horrible script. De Niro couldn't make, uh, you know that grandpa movie he just made any good so you know there are there are examples of of great actors and horrible material and also yeah it, it does really boil down to the writing i guess because they did this kind of in the 95 version where they introduced the characters in the movie as if like they expect it to be in an all in a theater where everybody's gonna stop and go oh my god shang lao is in it yes shang oh there's shang lao and stuff and you're just like all right that's that's corny find a better way to introduce these characters man yeah, so that kind of brings me to my next point where, again, we're not really kind of talking about spoilers about what happened in this movie, but Cole Young is the character that we kind of follow throughout the movie. And he's this device where in movies, if you're trying to do a lot of setup and you're trying to tell audiences about the plot and the ins and outs and the different characters, most of the time you'll kind of follow along this character that's also experiencing everything for the first time. So it kind of serves as a springboard for audiences and that character at the same time where they can explain everything and they can introduce everyone. And you're kind of going through the eyes of this main character who is experiencing everything for the first time. So what did you think about A, Cole Young as a character, and then B, if they maybe kind of devoted too much of the movie to him? Uh, well, that was... I don't again. It's kind of like with comic books. I don't really follow the games very much. I played the games back in the day. I'm not a big gamer. So is Cole Young a character from the game, or is he just a brand new for that's, the movie? That's that's kind of bridging on spoiler territory. So I can't really say whether he's based off of somebody or not. So you know we can't really go into that. But just what did you just think about him as a character, and then how much screen time we spent with him versus other people? I mean, I, I that wasn't a huge thing for me because I understand in any movie you have to have your main character who you're rooting for. In the 95 one, it was Liu Kang was the main character, but I guess Liu Kang was more of a known character back then, and he's one of the main guys. Um, I know a lot of people had issues that Johnny Cage wasn't in this movie or something, but with Cole Young, I didn't mind it. And, and the guy, again, that's another guy actor who was in, he was in Deadpool too. So I was like, I was a fan of the guy before going and seeing the movie and stuff. And so that wasn't one of my issues. I understand in a movie, you kind of got to pick the main guy to follow through, or it could become just too many characters that you have to keep a, keep a, a attention to. That's fair. I just, you know, for me personally, if you couldn't tell by my line of questioning, I just thought they spent too much screen time with this one character where you have all these different, unique, diverse characters and interesting stories that they have to tell. And then we're following Cole Young, who's pretty much just a regular guy throughout the movie and really honing in on him and stuff going on with him. And I just think they they devoted too much screen time to that. And instead of, again, the tournament or these other characters or what they were going through. So I wasn't really a huge fan of that kind of aspect of the movie. 
And again, it just, I felt like they, they made the whole thing to lead up to a sequel. So with that in mind, I'll ask you because I'm a little on the fence now. Will you watch a sequel to this movie if, if it gets made? Uh, yeah, having said all of that, yeah, I'll absolutely be watching the sequel. <laughs> Let's be honest. <laughs> yeah, I got to say, they, they have a lot to, to really work on and get right if they want me to tune in for the sequel. Because, yeah, I was just pretty disappointed with this because I thought it was almost a layup where if you just have a little bit of a budget behind it, if you have a little bit of a, a decent writing to it, it doesn't take much. It doesn't take much good writing to make this movie work. And somehow... They still couldn't get it right, but if you just have a little bit of a budget, a little bit, little bit of a right, a written production to this, that this could have been a very interesting movie, very unique, a lot of source material to work with, a lot of interesting characters, and they just didn't stick the landing. So they have a lot to do in my eyes to get the sequel right if they want me to tune in. There is a lot of work to be done for a sequel, and 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 we can see. A sequel, it might be like, let's see if this is a good analogy or not. I'm not sure. Do you remember The Purge? The Purge had such a great concept. But the first Purge was just like a movie about a home invasion. And you're like, that did deliver on the promise of what I wanted from The Purge. The sequel was what I wanted. It was anarchy on the street. I think it was even called The Purge Anarchy or something. But it was anarchy on the street. It was The Purge that you wanted to see. I have faith that the Mortal Kombat 2 can deliver on what I expected from Mortal Kombat 1, but I wish they would have got it right with Mortal Kombat 1. Same here. Again, I, I wish this movie would have been everything I wanted it to be and more. And not just saying that because I wanted it to shape up how I pictured it in my mind. I just wanted it to be a good movie, and I can't really say I think it is, so... You're right. I hope they get the sequel right. I really do. I really hope they make a lot better of a movie than they did with this one. And you're right, where we've had this felt like a movie where they had the source material and they knew what to do with it. All they had to do was just kind of press the button and they got it wrong. You know, and I'm with you with The Purge. And another example that we've talked about on a previous episode for me was World War Z, where you had such a rich source material of a book. And it was just a generic zombie movie. Nothing to do with the source material at all. And it's just so disappointing when studios do that. Just shame on them when they just take a great source material like that and just waste it completely. Yeah. So I guess let's end on two questions. One, are you a Mortal Kombat player? Are you familiar with the whole legacy and all that of Mortal Kombat? I'm familiar with it, but I will say I'm terrible at fighting games. I'm what people would call a button masher. I just hit a bunch of buttons and hope that I, I am good or I, I'm able to win. So I'm not a big fighting game person, but I am well aware of Mortal Kombat and the characters and the games. So, of course. And then second was the movie, the 95 movie. I, I can't remember if we talked about this on podcast or off, but were you a fan of the 95 movie or, or no? I've seen bits and pieces of both the Mortal Kombat movies from the 90s, neither all the way through. And I got to say, maybe it's a nostalgia thing for people that saw them back then, but I think they look terrible. I think they look like super dated, terribly acted. I mean, they, they could be funny as kind of B movies where you go back and it's unintentionally funny, kind of like a Sharknado. But I, I think they look terrible. I think people just kind of look at those with nostalgia goggles. Perhaps, I mean, yeah, I love the 95 version. The a sequel, Annihilation, no good at all. But but the original 95 one, and again, yeah, like you said, it could be it could be nostalgia. Because um, I remember the soundtrack for that movie was phenomenal, too. My parents got me to, they bribed me to stay home one Halloween, the Halloween 95, instead of going trick-or-treating, that my dad bought me the Mortal Kombat soundtrack as a way for me to stay home and hand out candy with him. <laughs> I was like, right on, I'll do that, no worries. So there's nostalgia there. But. So Mortal Kombat 2021, both of us a little sour on it. We'll see what they do with the sequel. All right, so that's going to do it for this week's episode of Life Imitating Movies. Uh, hopefully we pick some good movies that you may go back and, and check out. You know, Maybe you hadn't heard the term mumblecore before, as it doesn't seem Mitch had. But it's an interesting genre and some good picks in there. And 
Mortal Kombat, what more can we say that we already haven't said, man? You got to watch it for yourself, obviously, because those are just our opinions. But, you know, some people dug it, some people didn't. So anything you have to wrap up there, Mitch? No, just looking forward to covering some more new release movies. When they come out here during the summer, we're going to be getting some more as they're released on streaming services and maybe people start getting back into the theaters. So hopefully we'll have some more kind of big new release movies to talk about in the coming months here. Yeah, there you go. So we'll see you next week. Uh, what's it? As Mitch always says, we'll see you next Monday, 10 a.m. Shark. And uh, take it easy. <laughs>